such strange times. I was telling my friends, it's like time goes by, it's going by so fast because you can't believe that Thanksgiving and Christmas around the corner, but then it's also going by so slow because you can't do anything and you're home all the time. So it's such a strange, strange time. <laughs> it really is. It's, it's, that's, that's a great way to describe it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's so strange. I have a, a son. He was two when this started. Now he's three. So like that kind of, you know, it's like keeps track of time for me, but it also feels really strange. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So our our kids i have an 11 and 8 year old and it's yeah I, I i can't decide with them if it's like really weird for them or if this is just uh, another part of life like they haven't been around as long as we have so to them it's just yeah <laughs> I, I was wondering the same thing and i think it's weird for my son because when he was 2 he could play with everyone, touch everything. And, you know, they put everything in their mouth at that age. And then all of a sudden we were like, don't touch anything. Don't hug anyone. Don't put anything in your mouth. And like, we slapped things out of his hand. He probably thinks mom and dad went crazy. Like, he's like, what <laughs> happened to you guys all of a sudden, you know? Oh no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who knows, but that's what I think it must feel like. Cause for, you know, when up until one, he knows nothing. So from one to two, everything was normal. And then two to three, everything's been crazy. So he's oh. probably like, what happened to you guys? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's like one of the best things about being two or three is just putting everything in your mouth too. So. Yeah, yeah. And exploring, right? Like touching everything and everyone. And uh -huh. yeah. That's how they learn, yeah. that's how they learn the, the laws of the universe. <laughs> exactly. Like... Exactly. <laughs> yeah. How is New York right now? I lived in New York for about 10 years. So I. I oh, you did. New York oh, well, it's, can't... you know. Um, it was really scary and strange in the beginning because, you know, it was like it was like that movie. I am legend. You know, that Will Smith movie. Oh, yeah. I mean, it felt like that there was not a soul outside. And a couple of times I went outside after dark, like when the sun went down to grab milk for my son from just like CVS. And there was not a car, not a person, not a thing. I mean, you were the only person out there. And for New York. It just felt so, so bizarre. I took videos of me just walking down the street, like, so everyone could see what I could see. I, I might have to send you one. It was really, it was creepy and strange and, and weird. But uh, now things are looking way back to normal because outdoor seating at restaurants is open. And, uh, you know, it's New York, so people are dying to go out. So as soon as, like, restrictions are lifted a little bit, everyone's out. So it's feeling normal, even though we're not doing much ourselves but when we do go walk places it's like <laughs> a little life back in the city you know right i know when yeah. i lived there people would always be like is it safe and i'd be like new york's the safest place like you walk around yes. there's always somebody on the street so you always yes. feel safe so when it's when it felt like nobody around all of a sudden i'm sure i wouldn't have felt <laughs> yes i say the same thing at my friends because i'm from canada my friends say like is it safe there and i'm like i walk around all by myself well you know all the time and there's people every it feels so safe because there's people everywhere you know oh yeah i felt safer there than i do in some of like my nicer neighborhoods where i live now it's just because there's always people there was always multiple people on the street so yeah i say the same thing same totally. well it would have been a good time to have filmed the zombie movie or something yes i was saying that too. <laughs> you wouldn't have had to like get permits to close down the street i know, I know you wouldn't have to get permits you wouldn't need uh to close any like close streets down or anything <laughs> <laughs> all right let me do my formal intro hi i am michael i am a small business owner having owned everything from a design firm and, and restaurant in new york city to several pawn shops around the washington dc area i'm a real estate investor a computer programmer electronics tinkerer and improv artist actor in training always next scene searching and currently i am a tv host and your host for what we call the second scene podcast a dweebs global production where we interview people you know about things that they're not necessarily known for. I'm sorry I went a little over with my credentials today, but I'm with a woman uh, that has probably done 20 times more than I have. So I felt like I had to talk myself up a little bit. <laughs> I'm here with Gia Wirtz. Is that how you say your last name? Yeah, you got it right. Gia Wirtz. Gia has a 20 plus year super successful career in the fashion business development Having worked for many major brands from Bebe to Aldo Shoes, she started her own fashion brand called Studio 15 with a huge commitment to philanthropy with over 30 successful ventures for female entrepreneurs in Africa. I can't wait to ask her about that. She is also a writer for Forbes, Business.com, and Thrive Global. And none of these are a second scene. In 2019, she flipped her script and went into filmmaking. Her debut documentary, which she produced, directed, and edited, is titled Conviction. It has seen major success in the festival circuit from Greenwich International to Cannes International. I have seen it and it left me wanting to know more. It explores the inconsistencies in our justice system by following the conviction and exoneration of an innocent man. 
So please welcome Gia. Thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> was, that a, was that a good summary of you? Oh man, it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> They're usually about half that long. So. <laughs> Um, so you live in New York City. We were just talking all about that and, and how COVID is there. Uh, where are you originally from? I'm from Calgary, Alberta, in Canada. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, what brought you to the States? Um, I married an American. My husband is from Texas. <laughs> and that's what brought me here originally. And um, we lived in Houston for a couple of years. And then San Francisco is his favorite city. So we moved to San Francisco and we were there for almost 10 years. Um, and New York's my favorite city. So then after being in San Francisco for 10 years, we came out here. And we've been out here for like five, six years now. Was that a deal the two of you made? You'll do San Francisco first? You know, time it until... wasn't, but it kind of worked out that way. When we were, you know, my husband's a big uh, spreadsheet guy. Everything's on a spreadsheet. And so when we were first making our move to San Francisco or debating where to go, um, New York was on the list. You know, San Francisco was on the list and a couple other places. And, you know, he made a little spreadsheet of like cost of living and all the good stuff and bad stuff. And um, we ended up choosing, you know, either New York or San Francisco. And my work offered me a transfer to San Francisco and paid for our move and everything. So that made our decision much easier. Okay. And it was his favorite city. And so we went there. Um, and then just by chance, you know, 10 years later, um, because I started a fashion business, and this is a better place for it, we decided that we would come out here. So we kind of both got what we wanted. So that's nice. <laughs> okay. It's funny you put cost of living on your spreadsheets and you chose San Francisco or New York. <laughs> this would be like the last <laughs> ones to choose. Well, it was cost of living just between the two because okay. that's where we wanted to live. Yeah, we definitely did not compare it to Texas because we no. would have never left. Yeah. <laughs> Any other option, you would have been somewhere else. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so you've been in New York now for 10 years, you said? I know, just a little for five, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. we were in San Francisco for 10. Okay. When I look through... Uh, your LinkedIn, your resume, I, I really respect how you've, you've really worked from like the ground up in the fashion industry. You started as a sales associate. Yes. A store. Yes, I did. I started as a sales associate in a retail store and it just went up from there. And um, it really served me well in my career because every position I had that was, you know, up from there, I understood how everyone, you know, that worked under me did their job and so that really helped me be efficient in managing them or in coming up with policies or procedures or you know training guides and that and i think that's partially why i was so successful because I, I lived it and done it and understood it really well you know right i don't think most people even realize that's a possibility though that you could be a sales associate and work your way up the ladder you know i think people figure you need to come in at the at a higher level and, and start there rather than rather than work in the ground yeah i mean i was only like 17 or 18 when i did that you know so it was funny because i've always loved clothes it's just been you know a hobby of mine and so when i got that job and i like within a few years moved up um to a management position and when i was doing that job i felt like well i would do this as a hobby like i get to go to buying meetings with the owners and choose what clothes they're gonna you know sell at the store and i get to do visual like merchandising presentations in the windows and things like that and as like a 20 21 year old i was like i'm getting paid to do this like i would just do this for Fun, you know, I do this at home in my closet. <laughs> and so it felt it felt like that. And I really, really loved it. So I just stuck with it, you know. And when you stay with something for so long, of course, you know, you can move up. Retail is usually for people a uh, job they have while they're in school or while they're working towards something else, you know. Right. So what was the yeah. progression? Um, you know, I, I was it was really quick, actually. I was a salesperson for a very short time, then I became a assistant manager and then a manager and then a district manager. And so then I ran a district. Um, I think that happened within four years or three years or so. Um, and then once I got to that level, um, then I went, I actually had left college to take this job because it was full time. And so I quit and I went back to college and I got my degree in fashion merchandising. And, and then I started to apply at slightly higher positions because I had done a district manager position and I had the education. So um, then it took just, I would say, you know, I don't remember, my memory sucks, but a couple of years maybe till I moved more to the corporate side of things. And then I was in that for almost a decade. Okay. Did you did you enjoy the change? Because the corporate side is very different than the than the actual retail being on the floor side. 
you know, I did. I had been dying to make that change and I had been trying, you know, I'd been very vocal about wanting to make that change. So yeah, it was awesome. It did. There were parts I didn't like because there wasn't the interaction with people every day. And I really did like that. And you're on your feet all day. You know, we had, we had like stock rooms that were down two flights of stairs. So we would go up and down two flights of stairs. I don't even know a hundred times a day. So you'd kind of get a workout just at work. Um, so there's those things where you start sitting all day and you start feeling crappier and you know, you're in an office environment. Um, but but that's actually what triggered me to want to leave in the end is because I got tired of it. it became too bureaucratic it became too difficult to get anything done and that got really frustrating to me after after a while gotcha was it because you were working for such a large company yes it was such cool. a large company and every decision seemed to have to go through you know not only just people but entire departments and so it just took forever to do things and I feel like uh, large companies sometimes get stuck in their ways so they're not always so innovative and Tech, new technologies or even just new anything they're kind of uh I don't know if scared is the right word or just reluctant to take on and i started to really sense that all the time and it was uh it was a little demotivating gotcha yeah, i think that's that, that happens to a lot of the larger companies they're they're doing well and they're too afraid to make the change and then yes. the little guy next door passes them by because uh yeah they're finding the next the next wave did you go straight to opening your own company once you once you left this company because you were frustrated with the way they were operating yes yeah that's actually one of the reasons i left i was frustrated and i was like i can just do this on my own and so i started and i and i also believed in the online and not the brick and mortar because i was like it's just not working you know the rents are too high and the profits aren't enough and all of this stuff and so i um started an online company right away and that was like you know six six years ago now as soon as i left the company I was working for at the time. Okay, and that is that Studio Fifteen. Yep, yep, okay. it sure is. So how long you? I'm sorry. How long did you say it's been in business? Uh, six, seven, oh, seven years. Seven years. I guess that was 2013. Okay, and exactly, yeah. what is it? What is? What do you create? It's just a women's apparel company, um, and I design most of the clothes there, and we manufacture them, and then we donate um, five percent of the proceeds to a nonprofit organization, uh, Cleos. And what they do is they give microfinance loans to men and women in developing countries who are really living in poverty in some of the poorest places around the world, like in Uganda currently, and um, they give them training and finances to start their own businesses so they can kind of get out on their own two feet and work their way out of their situations. Well, have you seen directly what your your donations have done? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I haven't seen what my donations have done, but before I started donating, I've seen what the, the nonprofit organizations donations have done because I traveled up there um, before I started working with them. I went to Uganda and I was up there for a month or so and I met with the women and I interviewed them and I talked to them and and so many of them at that point had already had microfinance loans from the nonprofit. And so I got to hear what their lives were like pre getting that loan and then afterwards. And um, in almost every single case, um, women out there, first of all, they had multiple children, I mean, like three to six, seven each. And they said that before they had either, you know, no roof on their home, it was like a hut, or they didn't have a stove, or they didn't have all kinds of things. Um, food, you know, obviously didn't have a lot of food. Um, but they said that not only did, were they able to build, you know, a proper roof on their home or, or get a stove and things like that, but they were all, 100% of them were able to put all of their kids in school. So that was huge. And so that's why I partnered with them because the work they were doing was just, you know, amazing. And the women, you know, the way, so my brother is an executive director at the nonprofit and the way that they, and that's, you know, why I partnered with that nonprofit and um, the way that the women that got the loans talked about, he's my little brother. So the way they talked about him was really, you know, to me, I was like, that's my little brother. We used to like fight when we were little, but they talked about him like, you know, he's given me a new life. Like they had just had a, and it, it was really, really nice. And also just from a older sister's perspective, I was like, really him, <laughs> what? <laughs> but it was so, so awesome. Uh -oh. That's really neat. That's really, neat. I have a younger sister. And when I hear people say, you know, how, how, how successful she is and how smart she is or her accomplishments, it makes it like, gives you a warm feeling. Exactly. <laughs> That's how I felt, you uh -huh. know, and I don't think those women knew that he was my brother when I first interviewed them because I wanted to hear their, their honest opinion. I wanted to know how it really works for them. And so they were very candid and it was really, really nice for me. I mean, I told them afterwards, but <laughs> So what what types of businesses are these women starting? Um, you know, everything from growing, you know, like um, 
vegetables and fruit to um, raising chickens to sell, you know, for people to eat, um, secondhand clothing or just sewing, you know, making clothes, all very like basic necessity, you know, businesses, which is what they need out there. Um, but I met a guy who was making like cement blocks so that people could make cement homes instead of, you know, out of other materials that just weren't that uh, strong. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. It's all kinds of interesting. I have really great photos from there. <laughs> I, I am fascinated that you 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 knew you left this company knowing that you could start your own. Um, what? How did you have that confidence, or what did you do to be noticed in this online world of billions of other things you're in competition with? Yeah. You know. Um, to answer your first question, how did I know? You know, I didn't know, but what I knew is that for 20 years I had worked for, you know, very large companies. And like at Aldo, for example, in the first six months, I increased their business by millions, um, personally, just for my district, and like not even for, you know, the larger company. And so I had done this over and over and over and over again for every company that I ever worked for. So I was like, well, clearly I know how to grow the business, you know, because I can replicate it every single time. And so that's what gave me the confidence to do it for myself. Um, the challenge, though, was that I moved to online. And so, yes, it was impossible to st stand out in that environment. And that was a whole, a really big challenge for me because I had all this experience doing it with physical stores, you know, and I was really good at that. Right. But trying to stand out in a sea of online stores was very, very difficult, it is still very difficult. It's still something we're working on, you know. Um, so it's slow and steady is what I've learned. You can't do it as quickly unless you have a lot of money to put behind it or like you know you can hire the kardashians as the influencers to like instagram it or whatever uh, but unless you're going to go that route it's a slow and steady process so um they say that if you do it that way um you know without a huge influx of cash into marketing and whatnot that it takes about 10 years for your company to get enough seo and all of that stuff to really show up in google searches organically and stuff like that so you know we're like six ish years in so <laughs> <laughs> You really gotta have patience. I know I've I've had ideas before, and then I go and search online. I'm like, well, there's a lot of competition, and they have tons of money. So how am I ever yeah. gonna do that? And the funny thing is, ten years is such a long time in an industry like this where things are constantly changing. You know, mm -hmm. there's even the way you buy merchandise is changing, even the way you sell it is changing. So it's really funny because you got to keep up with everything that's changing while also being patient and sticking with it. <laughs> right, you you probably have a completely different company today than you did six years ago. And I do. Years, you're gonna have a whole nother company that's completely different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like the manufacturing process is so different today than it was when we started. It's just so interesting. How did you translate what you knew from brick and mortar into online? Um, you know, I had a lot of experience on the marketing side of it. And so that's what kind of stays the same, you know, because the uh, majority of the marketing um, was uh, I, I mean, some of it, a lot of it was online, but even the stuff that's not online was all, um, you know, physical mailers and things like that. It's kind of the same process in creating it and, and communicating something without having somebody in front of you, right? Without like talking to a customer face to face. So that was uh, really helpful. Right. You have any secrets you can share with people that would uh, help them get started or? Oh, goodness. Um, I guess the biggest thing, and I made this mistake in the beginning, is your branding has to be so crystal clear and your your branding has to have a very consistent message. So from the font that you use for your logo to the colors on your website to the product that you carry, like it all has to be so cohesive and customers are very quick to leave your website. When you see the analytics behind websites, you'll see that some people stay on the site for four seconds, like that's all you got. So if you can't, if, you, if your site doesn't load quickly and doesn't look great, like everything paints one message and you know who that target customer is, so you know um, what message to actually be sending, um, they'll leave and you only have those few seconds. So I think that's the most important thing is to spend your time doing your homework first and knowing exactly what it is that you want your brand message to be and then catering everything around that message. Got you, and really putting a purpose behind it. Yeah, really yeah, exactly. It. I know I do, uh, for one of my companies, we do weekly emails and I don't always have the patience to do the research that I should. And I sent one out and my open rate dropped by like 70% from like, I, I guess the random changes that I made. So 
a mistake is have a purpose behind what you're doing and the changes you're making. Yes, I'm really bad at those two, by the way. And I have the same experience. I, I need to hire someone that's just good at that because I can't do it. That's not my my thing. No. <laughs> Try to do it all. And, uh, you should hire hire the people that, that are good at what they do and and, and learn from them. I try yes. to hire I try to hire my employees based on my weaknesses. Yeah, the same. That that's what you got to do for sure. That's the winning formula. So how did you become a freelance writer for Forbes and Business.com? So um, Forbes did a story about um, Studio 15 and the nonprofit and and um, more so about the nonprofit, but it was tied. I, I had met some a Forbes editor and she wanted to do a story um, about the work that the nonprofit is doing. So it mentioned us and it talked about the nonprofit mostly. And um, through that, the, they really loved what we were doing and our mission behind Studio 15. And so they offered me um, a column because I had all this business experience so I could write about that. And that's just how it came about. Oh, wow. Wow. I saw you write a lot about e-commerce. Yeah. Yeah. I write about what I've, you know, I've done all this, <laughs> all these years. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I, do you enjoy, do you enjoy writing? Is it a, a has it always been a passion of yours? Did you know? You no, <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. My entire life, I hated writing. <laughs> and yes, even back in school, like English was my least favorite class. I'm just not a writer by, you know, naturally, I'm not a writer. That's not something I love to do. However, I found that business writing, um, I really enjoyed because it's, it's, uh, it's dry. It's like just matter of fact, you know, <laughs> and that I can do. I'm definitely not like a writer who would write, you know, fiction novels or, you know, stories and things like that. That's not my thing. But I have found a little, a little area that I'm good at, which is, like business writing. <laughs> Got you. So you're not really on the creative side of the fashion, I guess, even with your marketing, you're more of the, the, the business. Um, uh, yes. And you hire people to be the creative. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, in, as far as fashion design goes, that's a creative side that I, you know, I love and I'm all over, okay. but not like writing copy and, and that kind of stuff. No, I hire people to do that for sure. <laughs> Got you. Do you design your own pieces, your own, uh, the own clothes that you're selling? Yes, almost everything on the site I've designed. Oh, okay. So you're super creative. Yeah, creative. That's what I'm saying in the fashion clothing, you know, world. I am creative, just not in the writing world. <laughs> right. I'm sure you are. You just don't know it. I, I think once you're a creative person, it would it would it would come out if you were trying. I don't know. You know, I guess everyone has their own um, own vehicles, you know, because I can do it well when I'm making films, right? Because I have to write that story you know of course it's real life so it's written but you still have to write the way you're going to tell it and and the the beats that you want to capture and include so i guess in that way i can do it i'm just not a good sit down and write something creative on paper type person i got you i got you um <laughs> so i guess that leads us to the filmmaking what what led you you're really enjoying the fashion industry and creating this company why would you step out of that comfort zone so it wasn't making enough money because it's really, really hard to grow. And so that's like I was saying, it's a long game. And so I knew I had to wait longer before it gets more um, eyeballs on it, basically. And it kind of happened naturally. I, I had my son. And so I was, I was a stay-at-home mom. I had already, you know, left the corporate world and I was doing my business part-time on the side at home. And I didn't have, it takes a lot of time still, you know, it takes a lot of time to maintain a business online. And I just didn't have the time to devote to it um, that I needed once I had my son because we don't have family in New York. It's just us and there was no help, right? So um, I decided that I would, keep the business but scale it down a little bit and do it part-time and take care of my son and spend time with him you know you only get that time once in a life to it was a lifetime to spend that kind of time with with your kids and so i was like that's what i'm going to do and in that process i think it was my husband came home one day and was like you got to hear this podcast and i didn't used to be a podcast fan because podcasts weren't even a thing back then actually and i'm a very visual person so i like having the video and the audio and so i was like no nah, i don't want to hear it because it just doesn't keep my attention like my mind starts wandering off and then i'm like oh i missed the last 10 minutes you know what happened and so i said no and he was like well it's a true crime story and i've always been really passionate about true crime and so that kind of intrigued me and and then he said it's about a Pakistani family and my family's also Pakistani and so that you know kind of got me a little bit more I was like okay let's hear one episode and we ate dinner we listened to one episode and I was hooked and then he's I said play the next one and the next one and then we listened to four episodes and I was like play the next one he's like there's no more like it comes out every Thursday and this is all there is right now and I was like no like this can't be happening and of course that podcast was serial and the entire world was captivated by it 
Oh yeah, I think it introduced, yeah. it introduced a lot of people to the podcast world. So I, yeah. I, I know I was hooked. <laughs> exactly, right? And so I really believe in Adnan, Adnan the subject of cereal in his innocence. And so I was really bothered by the story. Like I was, I was thinking this is entertaining and everything, but there's a real person sitting in prison who shouldn't be there. And I wanted to do something to help. So I uh, tried to reach out to the family. I didn't hear back from them. Uh, and then I decided, you know, I didn't need to hear back from them in order to do something. And so I planned a fundraiser out here in New York and just got some local um, bands, like musicians together. And we did a one night fundraiser and I made these free Adnan shirts through Studio 15 since I had the means to do that. Um, and we sold the shirts and we had the fundraiser. And in this one little event, we raised a few thousand dollars and we donated it to his legal defense fund. And through that process, I was asking my friend who I was organizing the fundraiser with, you know, we need a speaker. Who should we have speak? Because we're not experts in wrongful convictions, you know, like we want to help, but we're not the right people to talk about this. And she said, I know a guy and he has a very, very similar story to Adnan. He was 16. He was wrongfully convicted of a murder. He was in high school. Um, you know, he went to a max security prison as a kid. And I said, OK, let me meet him. And that was Jeff. And she introduced me to Jeff. He was a speaker at my fundraiser. And then fast forward a few years later, later I went to film school and I, w I went to film school with the goal of making films about wrongful convictions. And uh, Jeff was the first person that came to mind because I knew him personally at that point. And so I reached out to him to see if I could tell his story. And, you know, he was game. And so we did it. <laughs> wow. So the, the people that aren't aware of what Serial is, it's a podcast. It was created by NP. Am I wrong? It was NPR. It was. It was. Okay. Okay. And it was like one of the first crime ones that really caught people's attention. And it was yes. a, a wrongly convicted uh, guy who was, he was in high school. God, I'm having trouble even remembering it. You probably remember better than me. He was in high school at the time. He was in high school. Yeah. He was 17 years old. He was in high school and he had dated a girl who they had broken up. She was dating someone else at this point. Um, but unfortunately she got, she was murdered and they pinned it on him and you know, there's no physical evidence and fast forward to today they've tested the dna and there's none of his dna on anything um, but he's still in prison you know for life about life plus 30 years i think it was so disturbing it was so, it was so disturbing to listen to it all the way through i mean it was captivating but it was sad it's just uh yeah that's how i felt it was so sad and well, it was it was so um it like left me feeling like it could happen to anybody you know and that's how I felt with Jeff too. I mean, he was just a kid in school, minding his own business. And when the cops, unfortunately, when the murder happened, the cops had to come to the school to question people. Um, they asked other students, you know, what they thought happened. And students said, well, talk to Jeff because he's quiet and he's a little bit awkward. And that was it. That was the beginning of the end for him. And, you know, myself, I was super awkward in school and had no friends. And so I totally, you know, feel that. And also it's just so apparent how it could happen to anyone. I mean, being quiet in school is not a, you know, jail sentence right right yeah uh, that, it's insane it's really insane um listening to him speak i was really uh i was really taken with he spent so much time in jail he really saw much more of a humanity to the other prisoners uh yes. i think a lot of us from the outside feel or see even or even think about um and i found that to be pretty powerful yeah, me too. Me too. When he talks about everything he saw and, you know, how he feels bad for the people that maybe were guilty, but of smaller crimes and they're being treated so inhumanely, um, it's heartbreaking. And, you know, I've always been passionate about people who've been wrongfully convicted, but I never really thought about everything that Jeff was saying until I heard him say it, you know, about everybody else in there and how they're treated. And that doesn't really help um, rehabilitation, you know? Right, right. Um, I was shocked that they took away college education for for prisoners in different areas. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems that you were just locking people up, spending tons of money to keep them behind bars, probably making them even harsher criminals instead of trying to do some type of rehabilitation uh, so that there could be a, possibly a life for them afterwards. I mean, otherwise, otherwise, why are we paying all this money to, to lock them up? It seems, it seems very counterintuitive. Exactly. Um, and if they do ever get out, I mean, by taking all that away, they're not going to be good members of society. And isn't that what we want? If they come back out for them to not do stuff like that again and, you know, be good functioning humans in the world. Right. Um, I also was uh, the solitary confinement discussion that you had with him. I'm, I'm claustrophobic. 
And that gives me nightmares to think about what he had to have gone through for so long. Um, oh, I can't imagine not even knowing what time of day it is, you know, mm -hmm. and, and all of that. Luckily for Jeff, um, I mean, luckily, I mean, not really at all, but he, he said he was only in solitary confinement for 28 days out of his, you know, 16 years. So thank goodness it wasn't more than that because it could have been. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, he was extra punished because they, they, they passed around information that he was a sexual offender. So he got to jail and he had enemies before he even got there. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, um, one of the reasons that I think you mentioned this in the film, but one of the reasons the police um, really got after him was because at her wake, at Angela's wake, the girl who was murdered, he was really emotional. He was crying. And they thought that he was crying because he was guilty. And he was really crying because he was just a sensitive kid. And he said it was his first brush with death and he had never experienced anything like that. And it really, you know, got to him. And so for me, when I was hearing him say that, I was thinking somebody who's extra sensitive, like the only kid in the room who doesn't really know her well, who's crying like that. And he's the one that gets put in this horrific situation in in prison with you know hardened criminals who are trying to now attack him i can't even imagine what he went through being no. a sensitive person you could see that he was he's he still kept the sensitivity that he had before you can still you can still tell he's a very sensitive sensitive man yeah i mean he is he's devoted his entire life to helping other people so for sure yeah which is incredible not to just spend every day holding you know holding holding it on your back and and yeah. I asked him, I said, why didn't you take, cause he got, he sued after he got out, he sued the prosecutor who got the false confession out of him. And he, I think also the medical examiner who um, did some falsified some DNA stuff when Jeff originally got convicted. Um, I said, why didn't you just take that money when you got it and just go to like Bahamas and just live your life and just relax and just, you know, enjoy being, you know, on the beach. And he's like, no, I can't just forget about the people I leave behind. I wouldn't be happy being in Bahamas knowing that my friends are still in there and some of them wrongfully and other ones being mistreated. And he was like, no way. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I know this was a short, documentary and you're planning to release a much longer one correct yes so this was a documentary short it's just 21 minutes and i'm working on the feature length film like the hour and a half long version uh so that's almost finished we're in post-production but covid put a big uh damper on everything we have two shoots left to do and we haven't been able to do them because one of them is in a prison and the prisons are completely shut down no one's allowed in or out um so and even family can't visit in a lot of the prisons right now so we're waiting until we can finish those last two shoots but but since the pandemic made everyone stay at home, I, I edited the film, so it's almost finished. We just need to add in those scenes. So I'm hoping that early 2021, uh, it'll be finished and then mid 2021, we can release it as long as, you know, the pandemic goes away. <laughs> I don't know if I could say I enjoyed, I enjoyed your documentary. I mean, it was, it was so fascinating. Can you say that? It's, uh... <laughs> you can, it's when people ask me, they're like, how was the filmmaking process? And, and it's so weird for me to say that I enjoyed it and it was fun because it seems like such odd words to use in this situation. And I always have to kind of, I always try and preface it with, well, what I mean is like the camera work and actually making the film, not the, <laughs> not the topic. And cause that was heartbreaking. And, you know, there were times I cried while editing my own film because it's so sad, you know? Right. Um, but I feel you, I feel the same way when people ask me, like, did you enjoy it? I'm like, well, I did, but does that sound weird? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jeff was just such a friendly guy. Like he was just, it was so easy to listen to him talk. And um... yeah, Jeff has a lot to say and he's really passionate about what he has to say. So he's a really great interview. Um, I always say this, I said this to Jeff, that he's a filmmaker's dream because he is so candid and so open and he's open about things that most people would have difficulty talking about, but he is just like, everything is fair game. He's like, you can ask me about anything and everything. And that makes it for a really great interview and really great discussion, you know, and that's what's enjoyable about talking to him is because it's so candid. Got you. Well, I could, I could definitely see that. Uh, and I cannot wait for the feature length. Again, not sure if I can say that, but I can't wait for the feature length. Um, do you have anything else that you're planning past there? Or are you trying to get through this and then see where you go? I'm trying to get through this. I have just briefly ha started having some calls and doing some writing on the third idea that I have for a, uh, another true crime documentary, um, which I can't say what it is yet because I want to do more research and make sure what I think 
is happening is actually happening <laughs> uh, so that we document uh, it correctly, you know? Um, but yeah, I'm just starting on um, writing the third one. Okay. All right. Well, I can't wait to see what you, what you bring us in the future. Um, this has been Second Scene with me, Michael, and thank you, Gia. This has been great. You can find more about Gia at geowertz.com, J-I-A-W-E-R-T-Z.com. Uh, you can catch her documentary, Conviction, on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's free if you have an Amazon Prime subscription, so please go check it out. Uh, and if you need more no-nonsense advice or free one-on-one -on -one mentorships in any area from resume writing to your mental health, send us your request at dweebsglobal.org and we will pair you with a mentor. Hey.